It seems like just a few weeks ago, Ontario's Minister of Finance was here with some decent news about the province's books, while warning there were still challenging times ahead. Well, we got the rest of the story earlier this week, when the Treasurer unveiled the province's fall economic statement. Let's get into the details with the MPP for Pickering Uxbridge. There's Peter Bethlen Falvey, who joins us now in studio. Welcome back. Great to be with you again after a few short weeks ago. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Let's go through the numbers here, shall we? Sheldon Osmond, our director, shall bring up the numbers now. This is $200 billion worth of spending for the 2022-23 budget. That's nearly $120 million more than was projected in the actual budget that you unveiled earlier this year. And here's a look at how some of that spending rolls out. For health care, north of $75 billion. That's almost 38% of all provincial program spending. Education clocks in at almost $32.5 billion. Interest on the debt is a biggie, $13.6 billion. That's almost 7% of all spending. And COVID-19, which is an item you wouldn't have seen on the budget a few years ago, $7.5 billion, time-limited spending, obviously. Let's go through a few more numbers here. GDP growth in 2021, 4.3%. In 2022, 2.6%. And you say unemployment, excuse me, employment in September of this year was 2% higher than pre-pandemic February of 2020. Next year, we're looking, though, at smaller numbers. 0.5% increase in 2024, only 1.6% growth, and in 2025, finally back up over 2%. And what about deficits? Boy, the deficits went through the roof during COVID. The projected deficit in 21-22 was north of $33 billion. Now you say the 2022-23 deficit will be just shy of $13 billion. That's a big number, but it's $7 billion lower than projected in the budget earlier this year. And this was after you announced, as you did last time you were here, a $2 billion surplus in September, the first surplus since 2008. For 2023-24, that fiscal year, you're anticipating an $8 billion deficit. And by 24-25, you are forecasting a very small $700 million deficit. There's no indication in this fall economic statement as to when the budget will be balanced. But if it's 700 million shy in 24-25, I think we can take some guesses, which we may come back to in a second. Okay, lots of numbers there, Treasurer. In your view, what does the public need to know? Which is the most relevant number, set of numbers there? You know, the, the, the most important numbers are the fact that uh, we have a plan to invest, as you highlighted, in critical areas such as healthcare, education, uh, the infrastructure, we got to build things, uh, not just for today, but for tomorrow. And that we're making progress on the fiscal situation in the environment of a lot of economic uncertainty. You know, seeing the deficit reduce is a good news story. Uh, as you mentioned, $7 billion lower than we had thought, uh, which we then can uh, borrow less, which means lower interest costs. All the while, continuing sticking with our plan to make those critical investments, uh, unprecedented in health care, education, and infrastructure. Budgets, of course, are financial documents, but they are not only financial documents. They are also, as you know, political documents. And I will circle back to that little comment I made now uh, about the deficits. One can't help but note that the budget will be almost balanced in 2025. The next election happens to be taking place in 2026. I'm sure that's just a coincidence, right? It is. It is, and I'll tell you why. Minister? Yeah, well, I'll tell Minister. you why. You know in the document, Steve, because I know you went through all 150 pages of the fall economic statement that uh, we provide scenarios. Because, you know, you don't know any better than I do uh, than the people of Ontario what the future is going to hold. Uh, what's important to the, in that environment is make sure you have a prudent fiscal plan, that we're transparent and lay out how we're going to spend the taxpayers' money. And every 90 days, every quarter, I'm out in front of the public saying, this is how we spent your money and this is how we think it's going to go. In that document is three different scenarios, a faster growth scenario, a slower growth scenario, and what uh, our expectations, which you mentioned the uh, deficit numbers. If things work out better, we're going to balance the budget even sooner. So that isn't, uh, uh, you know, anything we can, you know, certainly uh, forecast with precision. And now if things are worse, you know, the deficit will be higher and we'll be going to the uh, electorate with a a higher deficit. And what do your forecasters tell you about whether we're going into a recession now? Well, they've definitely, the, we rely on, on private sector forecasts and, and we've seen them come down. Mm -hmm. There's no question, you know, we're not an island here in Ontario. 
uh, and Canada were part of the global economy. You know, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine hasn't fully played out. Uh, we have supply chain still issues around the world with China and other jurisdictions. We are seeing central banks around the world increase interest rates to combat inflation. So there's a lot of economic uncertainty out, out there, but you know, we've, uh, we're confident in, in Ontario's uh, economy and, and the workers and the businesses here. So uh, I think we're prepared to meet whatever the future is going to hit us with. I see in the States, though, that, that they are now kind of monkeying with the definition of what a recession is. I always thought it was two consecutive quarters of negative growth. Uh, they're on the verge of that down there, and yet the president is saying, well, no, it's not a recession. Things are fine. Do you agree a recession is two consecutive quarters of negative growth, and are we on the verge of that? You know, that's the technical def definition, and I'm in your camp. That's the way I always understood uh, a recession. Uh, I, think, I think what they're saying in the U.S., it's also about the employment. And, and one of the things about uh, the employment, uh, you know, with an aging population, we've got more jobs than we have people. You know, we've got to think, we've been putting money into skills, retraining skills, development, uh, running hard on trying to get more immigrants uh, into uh, new Canadians, into Ontario. Uh, we're expecting, uh, you know, 200,000 this year. With the new numbers out of Ottawa, they're targeting 500,000, yep. and about 300,000 of those typically come to Ontario. So that's a good news story. But we got to be ready. We got to make sure we have infrastructure. Where are they going to live? You know, uh, where are they going to uh, get a job? You know, where are they going to uh, be able to put their kids in school? Our healthcare system, we got to keep building. One number that we did not share in that panoply of numbers off the top is what you are now proposing to do in your statement as it relates to people who are disabled in this province. Uh, the Ontario Disability Support Program, you, you how do I put this? You kind of took it in the teeth when you introduced the budget. There was a lot of criticism that, that you were not generous enough with people who, through no fault of their own, are in difficult times, and I think some people expected you to do more on that front. And now you are. You're going to allow people to earn $1,000 a month and still be eligible for ODSP, and you are indexing payments to inflation as well. Let me ask the question this way. Is that an acknowledgement by you and your government that you really didn't do enough in the budget that came out a few months ago? I think that's an acknowledgement that uh, many governments over the last 20 years, ever since the program was set up, didn't do enough. And, uh, you know, I've always said one of the reasons I got into politics is to make sure that, uh, you know, we grow the economy, get the fiscal house in order, but at the same time, help the, 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 the people most vulnerable. And so uh, increasing it, as you said, by 5%, indexing it to inflation. No government in 20 years has ever done that. Uh, and, and, and I also got some great feedback, which I thought was a good policy move, because I did it, um, to increase the earning exemption from $200 to $1,000, as you said, that they could earn every month um, without uh, losing any of their other benefits and being able to put that money in their pocket. I've heard from... Uh, the Ability Center, Community Living Toronto, saying this is a game changer. This is, we've been asking governments for 20 years for this. So is there more to do? Absolutely. There's a suite of programs as well to support people uh, most vulnerable, including uh, people on disability for uh, meals, medicine, dental care, vision, supportive housing, et cetera. And we, you know, so it's not just the money and the opportunities, a suite of, of programs, but I think that's the right thing to do. Let's talk health care. Winter is coming. COVID-19 is rearing its ugly head again. Uh, emergency departments are being told to be prepared for potential overruns again. Hospitals say they are struggling again. How much new money is there for health care in this budget, in this mini budget? Well, you know, the budget, you know, we didn't wait for the mini budget. The budget that we ran on back in June that we got roundly endorsed by the electorate uh, we came back in the... 40% of the electorate, but okay, keep Well, going. I don't know, though. That's the way democracy works. I agree. And that's the way the rules are set here, and uh, it was a bigger majority, as we talked about last yes, time. Yes, it was. Uh, so we recalled the legislature in the summer to pass that budget. In that budget is the numbers that you uh, pointed out right at the outset of your show. 120 uh, million more. Uh, no, no, that's on interest. No, in terms of the spending year over year, $5.6 billion for health. $3.6 billion for education. Should I have waited for the fall economic statement to put that in as new money? No, we got there early. And uh, that's going into all kinds of investments and programs, and uh, that will continue. Can you hire and maintain the staff that you need to to keep hospitals going, to keep schools going, if you insist on capping wages at 1%, as Bill 124 does? I hear from... Uh, 
uh, hospital CEOs uh, that there's enough money. Uh, the thing and what I hear uh, and we hear on constantly about the health care system is that we have to think differently about how we provide health care. Uh, that's why in that budget I also put a year ago at the fall economic statement a billion dollars in the home and community care. You know, that's part of the future. I've put in tax credits so that seniors can age, get funding to age at home to put the infrastructure and get home care at your home from healthcare professionals. It's thinking about the way we do credentialing of, of uh, people who live in this province who've been uh, trained elsewhere to make it faster for them to get into the healthcare system. It's the 5,000 re uh, retired nurses who, uh, who, if they want to come back into the system, you know, the red tape to get back in was brutal. But so I, I, there's a number of things, Steve, that I think is important for the people of Ontario to know that it's the money is increasing, it's record amounts, it's not just about the money, it's about the way we deliver health care. No, and I appreciate you're in a tough spot. You can't say yes to absolutely everybody who wants everything. I get that. But when hospital CEOs say, don't worry, we can do it with a 1% wage increase, but all of the, you know, the organizations that represent the actual people who work in these hospitals and clinics and schools and so on say, this bill is not going to do it. In fact, it's going to ensure that people don't stay in the profession and we can't attract the best people into these professions. How do you know who to listen to? Well, I listened to some of the uh, the numbers, the 11,400 healthcare workers that have come into the health system, the record amounts of uh, registered nurses that have been registered this year, the record amount in, in the history of the province. I look at, uh, the fact is that Bill 124 was a three-year moderation period, which is almost over, over for the healthcare for the nurses. So uh, we've also provided retention bonuses for the nurses, the $5,000 per nurse that was paid in May and September, less than two months ago. Uh, the permanent increase in the personal support worker wages of $3 an hour, that's also in the budget. So we didn't wait for, as you say, the mini budget and the fall economic statement. We got ahead of it. Let's talk education. The financial accountability officer, with whom you have had a few disputes in the past, but he's an independent, nonpartisan servant of the legislature. He said that your budget has a cumulative shortfall of $6 billion over six years as it relates to funding for education. Do you dispute his findings? I, I, I haven't gone through the full, uh, uh, his full report that came out just as I was doing the fall economic right. statement. Uh, but what I can tell you this is a couple of things. Uh, my deputy minister did say the differences in year one, two, and three are, are pretty small between his numbers and our numbers. Uh, number two, if you look at that budget that we passed in August, the increase in education funding is $3.6 billion. It's, as you mentioned, the second biggest light item. That's the biggest increase. Now, a big chunk of that is for child care. A chunk of that is for building more schools, putting more child care spaces in those schools, more funding per pupil, hiring more education workers, hiring more teachers, putting supports in for mental health, putting money in for uh, tutoring and for parents to catch up. So, you know, it's never one thing. It's a whole bunch of things. And, you know, the financial accountability officer can project far into the future. I'm dealing with the situation now, and I'm going out there every 90 days transparently saying, this is how we're spending your money. And I will say the Auditor General, who looks at the, 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 the numbers, mm -hmm. has given us a clean opinion for five straight years, mm -hmm. something the previous government didn't get. And by the way, the previous government didn't go out every 90 days. I come from the private sector. Imagine not facing your shareholders on your earnings every 90 days. I feel the same way in government. It's absolutely critical that I face the taxpayers every 90 days, good, bad, or ugly, on how we're spending their money. Your government also promised to create the conditions that would see 1.5 million new homes built over the next 10 years. The studies I have seen says that if you keep going at the current rate, you're only going to get halfway there. So would you acknowledge that the current policy is not going to, to use a famous three-word expression, get it done? Well, the, you know, certainly we inherited uh, an environment where houses and apartments <coughs> and condos weren't being built in sufficient supply for the that the, 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 the people that are coming to this province, our population is growing. So we got to make sure we have the policies in place. And you know, you and I are of a certain vintage we talked about earlier. Uh, we saw some of the, uh, uh, the early 80s where we had economic cycles with interest rates higher, inflation higher. But you know, we got through that. We saw even in the early 90s a boom in Toronto and then a, sh uh, a slowdown in, in construction. What we're committed to is looking through the cycles and building for the long time. And we've set that target of a million and a half homes over the next 10 years. We're going to work with the municipalities. We're going to 
work with all the tools that we have at our disposal because building a million and a half homes, allowing people the dream of home ownership is absolutely critical. My parents came here and it was my, not only my mother and her brother and my grandparents, but three great grandparents who all lived in one roof. They just wanted the opportunity to have a roof under the, over their heads, to have a job, to be able to put their uh, children and their grandson through education and be right here talking to you as Minister of Finance. Uh, okay, but we did talk about the fact that the Trudeau government now has a 500,000 immigrant target, and many of them, more than half of them probably, are going to end up here. Uh, I mean, does the math add, you're the treasurer, does the math add up? Can you, can you create conditions that will provide enough homes for all the people who want to live here? Doesn't sound like it. Well, we're, we're doing all kinds of policies to, to be able to give us a <laughs> shot. So, Steve, I'll make a commitment to you. When we hit the 10-year mark, let's have this uh, discussion and we'll see if we're at the one and a half million mark. But Lord knows we're going to try and we're going to work with all those partners. But it's not just the housing. You know, we have to build the schools. We have to build the hospitals, the aging population, the long-term care facilities. The broadband, I put $4 billion in for broadband because, you know, we got to connect people. We got to, the small businesses have to have the ability to have broadband to sell their goods. Uh, we have to, in the justice system, the healthcare system. So there's things, many things that we're doing to accommodate the growth. Uh, let's talk about the, ca the provincial gas tax holiday, which was, I gather, originally intended to be just temporary. You are now extending it to the end of next year as well. What's that going to cost the Treasury? $1.3 is that the best use of $1.3 billion? You know, we, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a good use uh, at a time when many people are hurting. You know, interest rates are very high and, and costs uh, more on a mortgage. Uh, you know, people going to the grocery, uh, I'm sure you have to gas up in your car. You know, every, many people are feeling the pinch. And uh, we've got 8 million people driving cars, many in Ontario, many who have to drive their kids to school or drive to get to work to provide a little bit of a relief, $195 uh, per household for the next 18 months. I'm willing to do that because, uh, and particularly for lower income people, that's a bigger part of their, their expense base. Uh, every little bit helps. It's not the only thing that we're doing. You know, we've increased the minimum wage. We've set the uh, tax credit rebate. So Ontarians, low income Ontarians pay the least amount of tax, uh, personal income tax in Canada. Uh, we're, uh, we're, we're, we announced, uh, you mentioned the Ontario Disability Support Program and the increase, but also the Guaranteed Annual Income Supplement, which we doubled, which will help uh, low-income seniors, about 200,000 low-income seniors. Um, okay, I know you're the Minister of Finance and you're not the Minister of Education, but you're going to forgive my wanting to take advantage of your being here to, set, to ask you whether the unprecedented preemptive attempt to use the notwithstanding clause to resolve the education workers issue that you're having, uh, whether in hindsight you guys would do anything differently on that? I don't think so. I, I think, uh, you know, our number one priority was to get the kids in school, to keep the kids in school. You know, t after two <clears throat> years of lockdowns and missing the social, the physical, the academic, uh, the mental health stresses of not being in school, we felt very strongly that we would use any tool at our disposal to ensure that our children could be in school. Now, you would know as a student of history that, uh, and, and we could maybe have another show on this, if we could have had a, a, the repatriation of the Constitution without the notwithstanding clause in the Constitution. And it's in there for, for a reason, to be used at the discretion of the provinces. Other provinces have used it. The Premier uh, showed leadership by saying, we want the children in school, we can't get a deal at reasonable terms, so we're going to use this. Does it trouble you at all that no government of any stripe for almost 40 years even thought about using that clause, and you guys have used it, or threatened to use it twice, and used it once already? It's there. Uh, we, we, you know, we take it very seriously. We're very deliberate and thoughtful about it. And uh, we felt the circumstances were so significant for our students, 2 million students in this province. You don't feel bad about having to walk it back and repeal the bill? I feel good that the students are in school. Okay. One last question here, and that is, uh, I know you're not the foreign affairs minister either, but you did have a meeting with the Hungarian president, Novak, who's a close ally of Prime Minister Orban, who is not what you'd call a poster child for democracy. Uh, he's one of the most illiberal authoritarian leaders in Europe these days. And now I know your background is Hungarian, and this would be, a, I suppose, an important courtesy call for, for you to make as a representative of this government. Did you have any qualms about what signal that would send to 
democracy-loving people in the province of Ontario to meet with her. You know, my focus on meeting, I meet with uh, foreign officials all the time, uh, but particularly given my Hungarian roots, uh, there's a plaque in, at Queen's Park, right beside, they're very close to the WHIP's office. And, uh, it, and it has a, uh, it's a plaque for the 1956 Freedom Fighters. And I had a colleague, uh, Rudy Cazetto, along with Michael Tobolo, who said, we want to do a private member's bill to recognize October as Hungarian Heritage Month. And, uh, and they got that through. And I'm really grateful to my colleagues for that because there's some 300,000 people who called uh, Canada home. My parents, when they came from um, Hungary, uh, there were two countries that were accepting uh, uh, refugees, no questions asked, and it was Venezuela and Canada. And one of the reasons I'm in politics, Steve, uh, I think you know this, is because I really want to give back to democracy. And democracy's not easy. Democracy's hard. It requires hard work and participation. And who said that? I think John Turner said there that. There you go. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's, that's, uh, that was the, uh, one of the reasons that I was very proud to meet with the President of Hungary and to, uh, to acknowledge the many Hungarians who fought in 1956 for freedom and democracy. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Minister Bethan Falvey, we always appreciate your visits to our studio. That is the Minister of Finance for the Province of Ontario, the MPP for Pickering Uxbridge, Peter Bethlen Falvey. Until next time. My pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.